Uh, please welcome uh, Kurt Whalen. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. And uh, I'll just start out and do a little, maybe an improvisation, sort of an impromptu piece. We'll just name it after we do it, and we'll do all the rights and copyrights and publish it and all of that, or not. But uh, do me a favor and mute this while I, while I play, then I'll talk. I'll end up playing a song, but I'll start off with an improvisation. And whoever can name the song gets free tickets to Jazz Fest from him. <laughs>
That was nice. Well, thank you very much. So name the song. <laughs> the prize goes to the guy who says Oleo. Just, just, no. You're right, Straight No Chaser. Straight No Chaser, which I was playing that song long before I knew what that meant, which means that uh, I was playing the saxophone long before I had ever been to a bar. So, <clears throat> once you learn the circular breathe, how do you do that? <clears throat> it's the funny thing about circular breathing. It's, it's what I call my worst habit um, in playing because it's antithetical to the classical kind of, you know, routine that you learn in terms of, you know, true, you know, legitimate breathing where you support from the diaphragm and, you know, and all the whole thing open the throat and circular breathing kind of, kind of, it's a shortcut, basically, to be able to, to pr play phrases as, basically as long as you want to. And I learned the circular beat years ago. It's uh, definitely not, not something that Kenny G came up with. It's, uh, it's, it's an inside joke, for those of you who don't know. Um, <clears throat> it's the old guys used to do it, and I learned it from one of the old guys. But it's, for those of you who may be interested in a very boring process, it's circular breathing is a process of taking, you have two cavities for air. <clears throat> one is your lungs, obviously. The other is your jaws. So what you, and there's two intakes for air, right? One here and one here. So you take in air, store it in your lungs. Now you're using that air to sustain the tone. That air is coming from here, right? Well, in the meantime, you fill up this, this alternate cavity for air. So now there's air coming through the horn, but there's a little bit auxiliary air tank here that's just stored. And as you run out of air, you do a little switch where you take a little air in to the big tank through your nose, but you use this to sustain the tone while you snatch that little breath of air. In other words, this is the guy that sort of saves the day while you take a breath. If you're good at it, people can't tell unless they're really looking. <clears throat> That's great. <laughs> <clears throat> That's beautiful. I feel like a freak of nature whenever I do that, though. You know, it's like, wow, he can hold a note. You know, the <laughs> thing is that, that as you know, with, with technique on an instrument, be it singing or playing an instrument, <clears throat> there's ways to sort of dazzle the public and not necessarily have the substance. So I've always been afraid of, of circular breathing, you know, as being, wait a minute. Boy, that guy's incredible. Oh, yeah, what'd he do, man? He held a note for 20 minutes. <laughs> and I go, well, but, but does he have any technique? Can he actually play? I don't know, but man, he can hold a note for 20 minutes. That's all I care about, you know? <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, American Idol is a good, a good example of, you know, you know, if you can just dazzle folks there for a minute, then, you know, it's easy to sort of take the spotlight off of the, the real thing, which is substance. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you've been doing this for a long time, Kurt. I mean, so can you, can you talk, to these, most of the students in this room are in, associated in the music business program, so they're, they're going to be in the support structure for artists. There are some artists and musicians here, too. Um, how do you keep a career going for that period of time? 36 years is a long time to sustain a career. Yeah, that's a really good question, um, and I'm still looking for the answer yeah. to that, but, uh, you know, I, honestly, I heard it once said by George Bohannon, who was a great trombone player, 
that the life of a musician is a life of faith. Now, I happen to be a believer in Jesus Christ, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of faith, but he said, even if you're not, it's still a life of faith, you know, because it's, it's basically faith in this gift that you have, even if you don't call it a gift. It's that gift that's going to ultimately uh, pave the way for you to make a living. So at, at the end of the day, you know, you can say, well, I'll just fall, I'll get something to fall back on. And that, uh, you know, may or may not be uh, a smart thing to do, because if you, if you spend a lot of time falling back or preparing to fall back, you know, guess what? You just might. <laughs> And my, really, my life is, I, I've not spent a lot of time concentrating on falling back because I, I just always felt like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I spent a lot of energy on perfecting my craft. And, and, and ultimately, my faith is that God has put this in me, and so I'm just going to go out here and do it. And that sounds kind of, you know, uh, mystical, but ultimately, there's no good answer to that question about, you know, how do you sustain a career? I mean, because there's a million different ways to do that. But the, but the primary thing is to believe in what you have been given, invest in it, and go outside and do it. You know, that's more or less, that's more or less my theory about how do you keep a career for that long. And again, I've been playing for 36 years since I was 12, and professionally, I guess, for about 25 years. But it's really about believing in what, you know, and you hear people say that, but that, to me, that's still it. That people can see and they can, they can even feel the, the confidence that you have, even when it's really mixed in with humility, the confidence that this is what I do, it's just what I'm put here to do. And so ultimately that, that really kind of is the only answer I can give for that question. How many times a year do you play in front of people? And that's another thing about what we do is that it's, you know, there's so many different ways to do it in terms of what is the mix, you know, how uh, there's teaching, there's playing live, there's, there's playing um, recording uh, in the studio. So uh, there, there's, there's always going to be some kind of a mix of that, and that mix will change, uh, you know, as one's career evolves. But for me, um, I guess really f still the, the, the main part of my career is playing live. And so I play many times 200 days a year, um, sometimes less. I think this year we'll average out to about 200 days. Uh, that's a lot of traveling, by the way. Those of you who uh, have traveled you know, since 9-11, it, it, it sort of doubles the wear and tear on your, on your body and your brain. So. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's primarily, you know, for me, it's, it's about playing live. I do a lot of recording and I do some teaching. Actually, there's a place in Memphis where I live called the Stax Museum of American Soul Music. Anybody ever heard of Stax Records? You better say yes if you guys have. <laughs> Stax Records, uh, Al Green, Isaac Hayes, Sam and Dave. Uh, Otis Redding. Otis Redding, you know, a little song called. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I just want to make sure I was in the right place. It's amazing. You seem to be just talking through your instrument. It's not, it's not like you're manipulating a piece of metal. It's just a communication for you. It really is. Is that how you think of it? It really is. And ultimately, that is what we are all doing. That's the business we're all in. We may not ever get a job for a Sprint or AT&T or whatever, but we're all in the communication business. Some of you guys will be communication facilitators, making sure the artist is in the right place, playing the right song at the right time. Um, 
others of you will make sure all the paperwork is done. But our job as artists is to communicate. And as a person who loves languages, I, I lived in, in France for a little while. When I was your age, I was actually blessed to study in France, in Paris, uh, to study French. Il y a quelqu'un qui parle français ici? No? OK. <laughs> Uh, and then I, I, so I speak French, but I love Spanish, and I'm actually estoy aprendiendo ahora para comunicar en español. Hay alguien que que habla español? Sí, pero bueno, más o menos. So, so language to me is very important, but ultimately the language, the language, it's the oldest cliche in the book, but the language that supersedes all languages is music. And if you ask me, instrumental music is the most powerful language because it, if you could think of the brain as more or less kind of, you know, like when you plug something in to the wall, the brain is kind of like the, the outlet, where you call it, you know, where you, you can plug into the brain. It's got to go through the brain, right? Maybe I should reverse that. But at any rate, the idea is that where it's ultimately going is your, your soul, your heart. That's ultimately where the information is going to either affect you or impact you one way or another or not, but the music, instrumental music in particular, bypasses that initial thing. It bypasses this filter where we all have, you know, we have our culture, we have our background, we have our language, we have all these other things that sort of filter the information before it gets to our soul. But this, See, like that stuff there gets, <laughs> it goes right past the brain. You know, you don't have to figure that out. You sort of feel that. And so ultimately, you know, that's what we do is we communicate. That's why it's the great paradox. Like, you know, the more you study music, like science, the more you study, well, oh, God is incredible because he put all these things together and now we are trying to figure it out. Music is like that too, to where the more you study, and you should, you know, I've studied, I still practice a lot of classical etudes. I do a lot of technical exercises. Every day I'm working on something. But the more you learn, the more you realize you really don't know anything because still the guy down there that I heard on Canal Street with his guitar, you know, and like he's got gold teeth and like, you know, that bad time, you know, on life. He can play, play that something that totally communicates, again, that's the operative word, it communicates more effectively, arguably, than all of your, you know, Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky and all that. I mean, all that, I love it all, but the idea is that it's really all valid because it's all about what? Communication, right? right. Well, a practical question. How do you get to these, tw these 200 gigs? You have a manager, obviously, and a booking agent. Do you have an infrastructure <coughs> support? I do. Um, starting with the booking agency, uh, there are some really good ones out there. The one we work with most often uh, is Variety Artists, and that's in San Luis Obispo, California. And uh, the, the really good agencies, if, if either they're huge and they have departments that really specialize in the particular kind of music that you play, or sort of general area, or they're small enough, like this one, to where all they do is that kind of music. So they know everybody on the planet who books acts that want to hear contemporary jazz or whatever you call it. They, sometimes they call our music smooth jazz. It sort of kind of bugs me. But, you know, everybody who wants to, vendors who want to buy that kind of music, well, this company has a list, a master list of all those people. So, so that company uh, keeps me pretty busy. Uh, the agent, uh, for fee, of course, 
the, the, my management, I have personal management. Well, let me back up. I have business management, which more or less is kind of like a glorified um, accounting firm. Depends. Business management. Sometimes the lines get a little blurred, and there are many times when there's one guy doing all of this. Um, but the business management for a slightly less fee will basically make sure you know, the IRS doesn't come looking for you and, and take that lovely car that you saved to buy. They are the ones that kind of they manage your business. They make sure that all the you know, I's are dotted and T's are crossed when it comes to the business of what you do. And I say specifically the finances of what you do. So there's booking agency, there's personal management, and then for me, I've, I'm sorry, there's business management, and then I have a personal manager who is kind of like, a, in many times cases, is kind of like a babysitter. Uh, I hate to admit it, but those of us who are on the, uh, the uh, right brain side tend to be, you know, we're, I say we're just focused. We have so much going on in here that's artistic <laughs> that, you know, some would say we're a little flighty. See, I would beg to differ. We're not, but um, no, but uh, so a, a personal manager deals with that. He deals with, you know, really every single aspect of what you do, dealing with, you know, negotiating with record companies, negotiating with book, booking agencies, uh, dealing with pers business management, um, logistics. My, my personal manager is a genius of logistics. He's a kind of a micromanaging guy. He, that's sort of his forte, is micromanagement. Like, you know, the itinerary is going to be flawless. When I, I have an itinerary here that told me that I need to be here today at 5 o'clock, and I knew what I had. Um, Alexandra. And Alexandra, but not Alexandria, but Alexandra. I had Alexandra's telephone number. I knew exactly what time to be downstairs at the hotel. He just gives me as many details as possible. You know, that way, you know, we can, we can curb the, again, my... I'm on the artistic side, the creative side, so, so there are times when he needs me not to be creative, so he has those lovely itineraries. So that's the kind of thing that a personal manager does. So you have a good support team. Great support team. I mentioned my wife. I mean, you know, my wife is actually, <laughs> she rides hurt on all of that, and, and I'm, I'm really blessed to have a great wife, but also someone who, um, she doesn't work outside the home, and I, we've always, for these many years, we've thought about, you know, with raising kids, one of whom, his name is Corey, and her, and her um, uh, she, she goes to a school called Loyola in New Orleans. But my wife, really, I'm grateful that she is um, on my team because I can't imagine trying to do this without someone like her. Even if you got all those, ple those pieces in place, ultimately it's a challenge to because those things are going to overlap and you need somebody there to go, hey, you know, you, you're doing a, a podcast and if you don't do it, it it's going to be later. You know, I do a podcast called The Bible in Your Ear. And it's something that I'm just reading through the Bible. And uh, people who perhaps will never pick up a Bible, they can just listen to my podcast and, and go, whoa, I didn't know that was in the Bible. You know, uh, so that's one of the things I do. My wife helps me to stay on target. Uh, I have a chat room I do on Tuesdays. Uh, people just come and sort of ask questions like this. And um, I type really fast, you know. But um, so my wife makes sure, she told me that today, she said, remember the podcast, the, uh, chat room tomorrow. So there's lots of things that she does. Um, so really, if you, if, you, if you analyze, you know, what my team is, definitely uh, she's a big part of it. That's my wife back there. Hi, Ruby. Just wave at people. <laughs> right there. Ruby, that's your Ruby. I was going to ask you if she traveled with you. Now that our children are in college, the last one went to full sale. Some of you may have uh, been interested in that school down in Florida. Uh, he's studying film, but a, a lot of uh, Music engineers come out of that school, mm -hmm. but um, last one's gone, so yeah, we get to travel a lot, a lot more. In fact, we're headed out to, uh, Marcus Miller is a good buddy of mine, those of you who may be familiar with, with Marcus, and he's doing a um, jazz cruise that um, basically, uh, it's called the North Sea Jazz Cruise, so the, so the, the, the cruise will go and, and kind of hang out in Scandinavia and the Mediterranean, whatever, and then it'll end up in um, Rotterdam, uh, where, which is where the North Sea Jazz Festival is, and uh, we'll participate in that festival. And the people basically who will, are on the ship, they'll hang out. It's like the hotel is, their hotel is the ship. And then they'll go to the jazz festival, and then they'll get back on the ship. That'll be fun, huh? Yeah. So anyway, she'll, she'll do that with me. She, 
She picks and chooses, you know, the fun stuff. You know, today in the intro, we were talking about um, uh, uh, ethical responsibilities amongst uh, the parties in the music industry. Do you feel yourself of having, having ethical responsibilities to your audience? I, I really do, man. I, I consider, and, and by the way, make sure I don't talk too long because I want to make sure you guys, if anybody has any questions to ask me, you know, I want to make sure we have room for that. But um, we do have a tremendous, uh, well, first of all, spiritual responsibility, I believe, to the audience because, um, you know, you, you, someone hands you, you know, a billion dollars and, and they say, you know, you have to spend this in a way that, that really lifts people up and really... Um, you kind of want to know, well, what do you want me to do with this? Because, you know, you gave it to me. And so that's kind of the way I look at my music, is that God gave it to me, so I want to know, what do you want me to do with it? And, and that responsibility kind of is to him, but it's ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately to the people. And I think of, you know, there's a musician in Nigeria, and I don't even know his name. It, maybe nobody does, but he's, a, he's blind, and he... He's never made a record, uh, never done a paying concert or whatever, but he gets up every morning, this blind man, he has like 10 children. He wakes up every morning, he goes to the, the marketplace, the center of town, and he plays. He plays this instrument and sings for the people, and then he comes home, and, and the people you know, give him money, and that's how he makes his living. And I think about him a lot because I'm like, you know, that's really it. That at the end of the day, all the business that you guys are learning, the infrastructure, all the technology, all the technique, all of that, at the end of the day, it's about what that guy is doing. He is a servant of the people. Now, how many artists do you, you know, do you think of who that word just jumps out? <laughs> servant. You know, not a lot because really I think we, you know, it's kind of flipped around to where artists feel like um, somehow, you know, they're special in the sense that they need to be served all the time. But it's really not that. And, and when you hear, for instance, a Bonnie Raitt, you know, somebody that I really consider to be, you know, a servant of the people, it washes over you in a different way. You know, James Taylor, I mean, there's a lot of artists I can name that I feel they're, 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 they're hardest to bring joy to the people and to communicate something of beauty. And again, in my case, something that God gave me to communicate, uh, which is the ultimate beauty. Do you, uh, you have a record contract, I take it? I do. Um, I'm with a label called Rendezvous, <clears throat> and that's a, sort of a boutique label. Um, as many of us now in jazz about... You could talk a lot more about this, but about uh, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the jazz labels all kind of, or the major labels all kind of went, hmm, jazz, eh, maybe not. <laughs> and so uh, they all sort of you know, cleaned house and, and all the artists, I mean, you know, that's everybody, Herbie Hancock, I mean, just name it. Jazz artists just sort of scattered and we found homes which actually I think are better suited for what, for what this music is about. And uh, I was on Columbia for years. Um, uh, well, CBS, Columbia, Sony, you know, all those names. And then I was uh, on Warner Brothers for about seven years, I think. And uh, I had a great run there. And um, it was actually the first time my career was in the black, which was beautiful. Um, How many records do you sell to get into the black? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> um, that threshold of when you actually start seeing money from being an artist is, is an is a enigma. And that really depends a lot on the kind of contract that you get. And I'm hoping that you guys are going to write the kind of contracts in this new age that uh, are a little fairer to the artists, you know. But definitely the age that you and I came up in, um, the contracts were very heavily skewed towards the, uh, the company. So, so definitely the deal that I signed in 1985, 84, my first deal, <clears throat> was pretty anemic. So, and unfortunately, you stuck to that for a while, depending on, and that's why when you guys are dealing with contracts, to make sure the term of the contract is, you know, has some kind of reasonable limit to it. Because it, once you sign it, you know, guess what? 
So um, it took a while for me to be in the black, you know. And, and, and what is the number of records? That's a good question. But um, I think it was way too many. They, they, they had cleaned up long before I made a dime. Do you have a, do you sell around 100,000 records or 50,000 records? I sell, I sell closer to 100,000 uh, per record. Uh, right now, the one we have out now is called Kirk Whalen Performs the Babyface Songbook. Huh. I love Babyface, a great songwriter. And uh, that one's, I think, around 80,000. Right Are you taking advantage of all the social websites on the internet and different I ways? have a MySpace. My daughter, Corey, who goes to a school called Loyola <laughs> in New Orleans, um, my daughter, Corey, uh, maintains my MySpace. Do you say my MySpace or do you say maintains MySpace? <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those burning questions. Like, what's the past tense of text? You know, I'm going to text you. Yesterday, I. <laughs> it sounds weird, but text it. <laughs> anyway, so no, um, I do have a MySpace page. That was a little tangent, all right? And, it, and yeah, actually I have about 11,000 friends on MySpace, which is kind of cool. Um, I think that's the only one we're doing. Do you sell merchandise when you're on the road? I do sell merchandise on the road, yeah. Um, that used to be taboo, too, and I, I, I bet you remember back in the day, um, when the Ma and Pa record stores were, were thriving and when the big record stores were thriving, neither one is thriving anymore, um, they really didn't like for you to sell merchandise on the road because, you know, you come in town and all, you're selling your CDs at, you know, there at the gig, well then what about Tower Records? They're going, hey, you know, what about it? We want to sell those records too. We're gonna, well then we'll just take your records off the shelf if you're going to sell them. So that was just the whole thing that was going on, but um, gratefully uh, now, we, um, we sort of do everything, you know, because more or less you buy records from, you know, from, the, from your company and you sell them and you make a little retail off of those. And uh, the company does good, you do good, et cetera. So you're happy with your record deal? I am very happy with my present deal. And um, I, was, I was actually happy with my Warner Brothers deal too, but um, that, that company was one of the ones that, you know, that, that no more jazzed. And um, again, I think that's, my, that's a good thing because uh, ultimately jazz as a kind of music is so broad um, and there's so many different um, styles of it and there's, it, it has so much substance and it's so important. Yes, it's, it's for entertainment, but it's also really kind of important. You know, you can't just put it out there any old kind of way. I'm glad that now the companies are smaller and they're more, sort of pay more attention to what, um, what it's about. Mm -hmm. Do you spend a certain amount of time every day on the business part of your career, or do you leave that to your wife, or do you leave it to right, your manager? Right, yeah. Yeah, I would love to leave that to my wife. Oh, yeah. I, I don't like doing it. But um, no, we kind of both work um, pretty good work day. You know, and the thing about the work day as a musician is there's just no such thing as like you may be emailing somebody, you know, at, at 11 o'clock at night or even later about something that's really important. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm posting. Um, PDFs of my charts. I uh, just did that yesterday for um, uh, posting them on, on a site for this, uh, this cruise with Marcus Miller. And, and I'm pulling down, you know, Herbie Hancock's on the cruise. And so, you, you know, he, he has his music on there. So we, I'm pulling that down. I've got to make sure I get that in my head. And um, so, yeah, I, I do wish that I had um, um, a way of checking out of the business part of, of what I do, but, um, but I don't. Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions of uh, Mr. Whalen? Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming in. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, I know that you've done a few gospel projects. Yes, sir. Um, how would you, what's your perspective on, on jazz artists and gospel artists merging together? We've done some things with, um, with Tata Vega. Oh, oh, uh, uh, um, Kimberell. Sure. Um, I'll say first of all that that gospel is a very interesting kind of. Um, uh, it's a dichotomy, really. Uh, when you talk of the gospel industry, it's like an oxymoron because you know the gospel is free. <laughs> gospel means good news and. And, um, and yet, uh, it, there is an industry 
uh, that deals in, you know, uh, the exchange of, of gospel music and gospel, you know, sermons and that kind of thing. So for me, yeah, I, that's always been something that I've thought a lot about because I feel that I'm called to do what I'm doing. And at the same time, like anybody else, though it is a calling, and I'm hoping that some of you guys are called into the music industry, the business part of it, because we need some people who have some conviction. You know, like, I'm called to do this, so there's only so crooked I can be, you know? <laughs> um, you know but I do feel that like it's a calling for me. Uh, at the same time, you know, though it is a calling, you do, you know, you should be uh, taken care of. You know, you, sh you should be able to send your kids to school like Loyola, you know, so in order to do that, you've got to make some cash. <laughs> Um, so to answer your question, um, I, I, I have this whole thing about the gospel aspect of what I do. You know, I play uh, in the mainstream. Uh, that's primarily my audience. Um, and I've always considered myself, uh, in a sense, a gospel musician because my heart is totally radically changed. I, I belong to Christ. So, so I feel like wherever I go, I, I'm representing him. But just so happens that I tend to rep I represent him in the mainstream marketplace. Okay, I'm not the guy who's beating somebody on the head with a Bible. I'm like, hey, God loves you, and you know, I'm here to just prove it. <laughs> but but then there's there's the there's the other side of it, and that's to do gospel records, records that will be marketed, product that's marketed to an uh, um, um, in the marketplace of gospel, and and sold at churches and that kind of thing. So. Um, I've always endeavored to make sure that people don't perceive me as a gospel artist because I don't want that. I want everybody to hear this music. But it just so happens if you ask me who I am, that's who I am. So it's kind of convoluted, but um, at the end of it, you know, I, I love making music for people, just anybody. But then there's, a, there's opportunities that I get to play in an environment uh, where people, you know, love Jesus and they just want to hear about him. You know, and that is cool too for me. And and those are the you know the gospel performances and playing at churches and stuff like that. And my career, by the way, is really becoming more and more kind of uh, integrated in that sense, where I do a lot of jazz festivals and stuff like that. But I, again, I do a lot. Of, I play a lot of churches. I even preached at a church yesterday in Houston. Uh, so it just depends. I'll get to play and then, and then speak. You know. How do you continually improve? what you're doing. Do, do, like at the end of a gig, do you talk over the, the performance with your band members and talk right. about what you can do better and what went right, what went wrong? Yeah, I, I don't tend to do that as much. I mean, yeah, we, we do, um, you know, I think a lot of that is, if you got the right musicians, this is just my way of looking at it, they kind of know at the end of the set, you know, what was sort of screwed up, you know. You don't really have to beat them in the head. but. But, but, I, but individually, I can answer that question by saying, um, man, I, I hope to always be growing in my craft. Um, to me, that's really, really important. If I ever found myself in a situation where I wasn't growing, um, then I don't think I could be happy. I don't care how much money I was making. In fact, I was playing jazz, doing my thing, and then in 19... 1989, I got a call from a buddy who said, how would you like to play with Whitney Houston? I said, well, I love Whitney Houston, man, but I never thought about it, you know? He said, well, I, I just got promoted to musical director. And you may have seen this guy on, on American Idol. His name was Ricky Minor. But at the time, he was Whitney. He's, he's just gotten promoted. He said, well, I'm asking you, do you want to play with Whitney Houston? I said, I don't know, how much does it pay? <laughs> you know? And he said, basically a lot. And uh, so I did that. And, and thinking, okay, this will be a year or two. Well, it ended up being seven years. And again, I'm a jazz musician, but I'm here. I'm doing this big pop tour, and um, you know, it, it was a great experience. You know, and I, and I made a lot of money. It was the first time in my life where, again, the life of faith concept. This was the first time where I knew well, I'm going to be making X amount of dollars per week, as long as I want to. You know, but again, I categorically knew that it wasn't something I wanted to do forever because of the fact that the, the, it was very limiting in terms of my potential to grow on my instrument. In other words, I wanted, I got into this business. See, there you go. I didn't get into this business in order to do this. I started playing. And that's another funny kind of word. You know, I said, well, are you, are you playing tonight? <laughs> you know, most people's kids, 
that you know they talk about their their dad going to or mom going to work <laughs> and they asked my daughter so where's your dad going to play <laughs> so it's like playing where it's work <laughs> you know but i'm playing um i lost my point where was I, <laughs> I lost your point too yeah no, <clears throat> whoa, whoa, whoa. no it was it was about improving oh improving yeah so i i i knew i knew right away that this wasn't something that i was gonna <laughs> want to do forever because I was not going to be growing and that to me was was vital because I started out because I wanted to be good I heard this guy named Hank Crawford and then I heard this guy named John Coltrane and I heard you know I mean you can go all down the line Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt and Sonny Rollins and I heard these guys and I'm like I want to play like that Michael Brecker who just passed away you know he's somebody you hear you go I want to be able to do that so to do that you have to guess what <laughs> work a lot at it so that's really my life. Even now, I have to spend a lot of time practicing, a lot of time just trying to focus on areas of my playing and all of that. So, um, yeah, to me, that's, that's paramount, is, is growing on my instruments. Do you find yourself thinking differently when you're playing, say, in a church as opposed to in a nightclub, when you create? That's a really good question. Uh, there are times in both places uh, in the quote unquote mainstream secular environment and in the sacred environment when I'm totally lost in what I'm doing, which is the most beautiful thing. It's the most beautiful place that an artist can be. Um, to me, that's divine. That's when, you really, that's when you're really linked up and you're basically out of the way. It's like all of a sudden, you, you know, you close your eyes and you're in this place and it's a place that I can't Describe is not obviously a geographical place, but it's a place where you're just grabbing ideas and sort of messing around with these things in this sort of cosmic area where when you're finished, you kind of oh, you sort of wake up, you know, and that's the place I love to be. Um, but there's so much technical about playing an instrument, about singing, that yeah, you, you can't totally lose your way. You know, you have to kind of keep, you know, keep in mind, you know, the tone for, or, or even intonation, for instance. You know, that, that's nice when you play in, in tune. <laughs> you know, so those are things that you, and you know, and things like I, I, I make sure that I keep my fingers curved and on the keys. You know, there are certain things that saxophone players, you know, learn that this is the way you should do this instrument, the classical sort of, you know, pedagogy, as, you, as it were. So. So to answer a question, I love to be in that place where I'm not thinking about those things, but, but they are somewhere, they're somewhere in the, it's kind of like, you know, driving a stick shift car, you know, you, once you learn it, then you basically forget it, but you can't totally forget it because you, you know, run into somebody, so it's there, you know. Are you trying to deliver a message when you're playing music? Do you go into it like that or are you just going to play the song and see what happens? Right, I think there's a sort of abandon to it. It's again back to the, it's a dichotomy. It's like, you, if you get too serious about what you know, I'm delivering this message. Really, I mean, you can mess it up. You know, it's more like kind of getting out of the way, realizing that you are a messenger, and there's something mm -hmm. that that needs to be delivered. It's like being working for FedEx. You know, I'm from Memphis, and that's the home of Federal Express. So you work for FedEx. You are there with the package. Okay, you have a great deal of purpose. You know that your job is to deliver the package. Now you don't go and look in the package. <laughs> that ain't your job, you know. So in other words, there's a degree of mystery to it that I like. It's like, no, I'm here because I'm supposed to be here and there's something that needs to be communicated through me. But I don't want to get too intent, and I've done that, you know, where I take myself a little too seriously and I end up, you know, offending someone or just kind of messing it up. But um, you definitely, I feel like we're all, we all have that in common. We're all messengers of one kind or another. Great. Any, anybody have another question? Yes, sir. Michael. Do you ever feel limited by your instrument? Like, do you ever feel like you wish you, you played something else and you can't express yourself yeah. with, with just an instrument that can only play one thing at a time? Right, absolutely. When you feel like that, what do you, what do, you do? I go to Tim and I say, Tim, what do you do about you? No, never mind. Tim Hall, very good friend of mine. How you doing? Uh, um, I do envy people who can either play monophonic or polyphonic at the, you know, at the drop of a hat. I play one note. I play five notes. Um, there are times, but I, my limitation is it's not so much that because I'm used to that. 
my limitation, that I, I feel like I'm limited by what I can actually pull off, you know, that, and you'll always feel that because there's never a point where you, you're there. Uh, I, do, I do wish I played piano because with piano you can, you can accompany yourself. So, you know, when it's time to improvise, you're playing along. So Herbie Hancock, he'll change the chord and he'll improvise to that chord while you're in another, and then he'll change it back. And then, you know, so I'm like, if I do that, it sounds wrong because they didn't change the chord at any rate. <laughs> Anybody? What kind of advice would you offer to uh, people who want to go into the world of playing music? Hold that question. Um, advice for people who want to play music, to be in the world of music even. Yeah. As a non-player, as a player, is there something you've learned in all these years of doing this that you think that you need to tell? Yes. Um, don't do it. <laughs> Seriously, don't do it unless you really are called to do it. You know, um, uh, I guess more seriously, I, I really believe that um, there's a scripture that says that he, he was faithful and, and little, God will make you ruler over much or basically put more in your hand. It's like you invest your money well, then people will want to give you more money to invest type thing. Well, I believe that, and that's really how, I believe that's how I got discovered in, in this business. And that quick story is that I was playing, my band was playing there in the Houston area. Anybody from Texas? Texas in the house. Uh, Tim is from Houston, that's right. So I was there playing in, in, in the Houston jazz scene, and I was fortunate because what I was doing, it was a lot of, original music. I could just, we could play jazz covers, or whatever, but, but I was writing constantly. So I had, it was a great workshop for me. So there I am playing and with my own band. So I had, we did a lot of rehearsing and we work in new songs and we just, we tried to make sure, basically when I walked in that club, when I was on that stage, if it was 15 people or it was 150, I wanted those people to remember that. I was very serious about that one set right there. You know, I put my heart and soul into that set, you know, and it was in that context that I was discovered. In other words, people say, well, how do I get a big break? Well, you send cards to this one and you internet and you MySpace and you, you get in people's face and you send them their your CDs and well, all of that. But to me, that's all sort of incidental. How you get discovered is you're doing your thing very well. That's how you get discovered. You're doing your thing very, very well and somebody is going to hear you. That's just how it goes. It's not a mystery, you know, because all the networking and stuff to me is kind of like weird, you know. It's like, hi, I'm Kirk Leno. I play saxophone. How do you like me so far? You know, no, it, it, it's really about God giving you a gift, you taking that gift and developing it and really being on point at every given point. If it's a big opportunity, if it's a small opportunity, it doesn't matter. You're doing it in such a way that you're ultimately going to get promoted. That's just the way I believe it. Would you play something for us uh, to close out the... My uh, pleasure. You had a quick I'm question a over there or no? You got to be fast. Oh, wow. That, there you go. That's what I'm playing. <laughs> A uh, quick story, when I recorded that song with Whitney Houston, it was because she, had, she insisted that her band play on The Bodyguard. You know, they say, oh, Whitney, you know, David Foster, big producer, uh, no, we're going to get a studio band, and we're going to make the track, and we'll have the track there, and you can just pantomime to the track, and then we'll, we'll dub you in later, and this is just how we do it in the industry. You know, they say, she's a diva, she doesn't know what she's talking about, and no, we'll just blah, blah, She said, well, nah, that's a big song, I really want my band there. They're like, uh, please, you know. So they went back and forth and back and forth, and she finally said, you know what, you're right, David, you should get a studio band and, um, and also get a singer. Because if I sing it, my band is going to play. And that's why, to this day, I was on that record. And we did it live to the film. When you see The Bodyguard, um, we're actually backstage behind the curtain recording as she's playing. Ricky Miner's back there looking at her and looking at us, and we're playing. And I played my solo. By the way, that solo has one note in it that's very sharp. <laughs> and to this day, I wanted to, to, I wanted to fix, we normally would go in and fix that note. That's just what we do, right, you engineers? Uh, but, but because Clive Davis 
who's head of Arista Records, said, you know, no, this is it. They handed him, David Foster handed him obligatory rough mix of the session. In other words, if we, at, on the movie set, you got this rough mix that they just sort of, you know, it's on a DAT, a DAT. He handed him the DAT of the rough mix, and Clyde puts his headphones on, and he's like, that's it, you know? And, and, and so, of course, the producers are great, excellent, all right, can't wait to go in and, you know, add strings here and sort of, you know, I'm gonna fix that sax note, I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna put some more reverb, you know, and blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, no, 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 that's it. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 no. No, you mean that's it, like we, we're gonna take, no, that's it, thank you. So what you hear is literally the rough mix of that day, and that is, that's historic, you know. I don't know if that happens a lot. By the way, I practice with my tuner a lot. <laughs> After that experience, I got a lot more serious about practicing with my tuner. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Kurt Whalen. Good to Thank see you, you again. Man. That was great. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. much.